This is Mercedes-Benz GLE and this is Range Rover Velar. You can find separate reviews of these SUVs on my channel by clicking the link in the upper right corner or in the description below. If this is your first time to my channel, don't forget to subscribe and press the bell icon to get notifications of my weekly reviews. And now let's compare these two gentle giants. I'll be comparing the styling, the boots, the passenger space, cockpit layout and infotainment, as well as on-road and basic off-road performance. And now I'm gonna fall down. <laughs> I mentioned this in my Velar review. At first glance, the Range Rover looks like a slightly raised station wagon. That's because after you turn the ignition off, air suspension drops to make getting in and out easier. The Velar is around 2 meters wide, 480 centimeters long and almost 170 centimeters high. However, Range Rover states the width with the mirrors unfolded or folded, and even folded mirrors stick out beyond the shape of the car. Meanwhile, the GLE is 195 centimeters wide, but much wider at the bottom half than on the top half. When the cars are parked one in front of the other, you can't see the Velar from behind the GLE. Moreover, the GLE is much longer at 492 centimeters and taller at 177 centimeters. Both cars look modern, but the Mercedes is beefier, more muscular. Compared to the GLE, the Velar looks more conservative. Which look suits you more? Let me know in the comment section below. And now let's look inside the boots. Mercedes-Benz GLE promises 630 liters boot volume VDA. In reality, there is about 450 liters above the floor. The rest is underfloor storage, which disappears if you order the optional third row of seats. There is virtually no load lip. There is a net on the side to store some smaller items, a 12-volt socket and a button to lower the rear suspension for easier access. The cargo cover and the net to separate the boot from the passenger compartment are heavy but easy to remove. Mercedes offers electronically folding seats in the second row, but as standard you don't even get levers to fold the seats and you either have to reach deep inside the boot or fold them from the passenger compartment. There is a button to close the tailgate and to lock the car. The hands-free tailgate opening sensors in Range Rovers and Jaguars are somewhere around the corner of the vehicle. Good luck finding them. But they are somewhere around here. Come on. I'm not kidding, just... They... they are here, you know? I. I Open up, you... There you go. So anyway, uh, officially the Range Rover Velar has 673 liters boot volume. However, in reality, there is also about 450 liters above the floor. And the underfloor storage is, in case of this test example, occupied by a mini spare, which is standard in Poland. The load lip here is around 10 centimeters high and it makes loading heavier items difficult. There is an alcove, probably to fit a golf bag across. There are four shopping bag hooks. Removing the boot cover should be a breeze, but it's not. There are levers to fold the seats in the second row. They also tilt electronically, increasing or decreasing the amount of cargo space. There is a button to close the tailgate, but it doesn't lock the car. The backrest tilt in the Velar can be electrically adjusted. This car doesn't have third zone climate control or USB ports, they're an option. There is only a 12 volt socket. The transmission tunnel is about 20 centimeters high and about 30 centimeters wide. There is an armrest with two cup holders. Door bins are big enough for nothing more than a small bottle. There are also pockets in the front seats. I am 175 centimeters tall, the driver's seat is set for me and I still have around 10 centimeters legroom left. There is also about 8 centimeters headroom. With the suspension in its lowest setting, it's easy to get out. In the GLE, it's easy to see the difference in wheelbase. At almost 3 meters, it's 
13 centimeters longer than in the Velara. I have around 20 centimeters leg room and over 10 centimeters headroom. The tunnel is wide but much lower than in the Velar. There is dual zone climate control in the back, part of the air balance pack. There are two USB-C ports and a place for two phones. The door bins are large, there are also nets in the seats. Back seats do not tilt in this test car but this option is available. The GLE is slightly higher so I have to be careful getting out and shorter people will need to use the integrated step. For a few years now, Mercedes installs this huge double screen which runs across two-thirds of the dash. In the GLE, the integration looks the most natural. It looks like it's been designed like that, not like a last-minute add-on. I like how the air vents continue across to here, like in old subs, like if there are any new ones, and like in the Mercedes EQC. On the downside, these bars here, they get dusty and they are hard to keep clean. The element to close the cup holders and the phone cradle is like from a drinks cabinet. There are two USB-C ports, a 12 volt socket, an induction charger, glove box and storage under the armrest are big enough. There is a USB-C port under the armrest as well. The door bins are large and there are buttons to open the boot and for the optional tow hitch. By the way, the Merc can tow 2.7 tons and the Velar 2.5 tons. Briefly about the infotainment system, it deserves a separate long and boring video, so let me just tell you about what I really like. You can control it with touchpads on the center console, on the steering wheel, as well as via touchscreen. There are so many options, you better store them on your cloud profile, otherwise you'll never find them again. There are also voice commands and an intelligent assistant, which you activate by saying, hey Mercedes. Satnav gets augmented reality, so before a turn you see a camera view of the road with street names and numbers as well as arrows pointing you in the right direction. Compared to the GLE, the Velar cockpit looks more modest. The infotainment system on its own is fine, but switching from the Mercedes, these displays look dated. There is also a lot of glossy black plastic which gets dirty just from looking at it. Cup holders are small, storage is small, Durbins are small. Switching from the GLE, you wonder whether this is the Velar or the Evoque, which, by the way, has an improved version of the Range Rover cockpit. The JLR infotainment system is buggy. Two years ago, in the test Velar, the system kept crashing. In the ePays, there was a line running across the screen. And in this one, the 360 camera doesn't work. Otherwise, the system is pleasant and relatively intuitive to use. As long as it works. The Velar has still a dial to select gears. For some time, all new JLR cars had this type of gear selector, but now they're going back to a regular shifter, even though there is no physical connection between the shifter and the gearbox. I guess the clients like it the old-fashioned way. This test Velar is powered by 275 horsepower 600 diesel. Earlier, I drove the 300 horsepower version. Both engines were refined and they are relatively quiet and economical. You can achieve around 10 liters per 100 kilometers around the city and combined 7.8 is realistic. For an SUV, Velar handling is quite sporty. The car likes corners probably more than the passengers, but the driver will always have a smile on his face or on her face. The suspension could be a bit more comfortable, but then it would spoil the sporty handling, so you can't have everything. In sports mode, you can configure suspension stiffness, steering, feel reaction to the gas pedal, and then the Velar really gets going. Just don't forget, you are still driving a two-ton SUV.
If you don't get to drive Mercedes cars very often, you probably look for wipers where the gear selector is and the other way around. If a Mercedes is your daily, then you get into any other car and you turn on the wipers instead of putting the car in gear. This test car has the model variant badge removed, so your neighbors won't realize it's a 300D. And like in the BMW 330, the 3 or 30 doesn't mean 6 cylinders, doesn't mean 3 liters. A 300D is actually a 2 liter 245 horsepower diesel. I assume you buy a car like this to drive around the city or maybe on the motorway with a constant speed but not to cut corners on twisty roads. The AMG styling package is purely an image thing because the GLE is best in a straight line. Around the city you won't feel GLE 300D is a four-cylinder, you know, it's fine. On the motorway at constant speed you'll be fine, however, on a country road if you want to overtake, you put the pedal to the metal and there is nothing happening and that car that was on a horizon a second ago is now very, very close, too close for comfort. Realistic fuel consumption is similar to that in a 3-liter Range Rover, so your main savings are on the purchase price and possibly on taxes, but not on, on fuel as such. This test car has the optional acoustic package, which features things like laminated glass with membranes that uh, absorb sound, as well as tires with foam in them to absorb low-frequency rolling noise. There are also other soundproofing measures, but the end result is that this car inside is almost as quiet as a Rolls-Royce. I even wondered if there is some sort of active sound cancellation system like in a Ford Mondeo Vignale, but no, it's all mechanical. There is also a voice amplifier for passengers to talk to each other without raising voices. There is a slight echo, but not as bad as an Skoda Kodiak. In my review, I drove the Velar off-road. I have no doubt about its capabilities. It has 251mm ground clearance with the air suspension, approach and departure angles are around 29 degrees, the breakover angle is 24 degrees, and wading depth is 65 centimeters. The only thing that can stop the Velar are road tires. However, even on road tires, it coped better than the BMW X5 with the off-road package. But in this case, the breakover angle proved insufficient and I had to find a less aggressive incline. Mercedes GLE can be equipped with an off-road engineering package which costs about 10,000 euro along with the necessary air suspension. With the off-road pack, the GLE has 27 degrees approach and 29 degrees departure angle and can wade up to 60 centimeters deep. This test car doesn't have the off-road package or even the more sophisticated all-wheel drive system. So on the incline that the Velar finally climbed with ease, the Mercedes is still clearly struggling. The GLE test car costs around 100,000 euro. Taking into account different engines and the lack of off-road pack on the Mercedes, the Range Rover is in fact cheaper. Both of these cars have their strengths and weaknesses. I really have a problem deciding which one to take home. And which one of these SUVs tickles your fancy? Let me know in the comment section below. If you'd like to see more comparisons like this, share this video with your friends and give it a thumbs up. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next one.